Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to this patch video for there is no epic loot here, only puns taken from the website Royal Road. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Please don't forget to do all the usual YouTube stuff as that helps the video and the channel with the algorithm. Chapter 121 Rooted in Her Ways Hero was somewhat of a mana drain on Delta. She watched her streams of orange mana that usually spread out and conquered rooms to subsume into the dungeon twist like lifelines into a hero's body. If she hadn't visibly shut off her other streams, the first and second floor would have been running in life support mode, where only the bosses and some rooms would be operational for adventurers. Hero was amazing, almost unstoppable, but Delta couldn't actually afford to keep him going for much longer. He was an incremental cost raid boss, with more and more mana being pumped into him on the account of his tricks that he was coming up with and the distance he was making. There was also the fact that Hero was also given a personality and developing intellect, which, in terms of the system, made him more costly than a simple war engine than most raid bosses would be otherwise. Yet, uh, even with all of that in mind, she watched with the barest of awareness around Hero since he was so far out of a dungeon that only the immediate space around him was revealed to Delta. She could only look at a monster who was slammed into a wall of dilapidated mana foyer. It was a rather strange and bizarre for such a normal thing to be seen in the deep fortress of the dead. Hero grunted and his arms exploded into slithering bulbous mushrooms that sunk into the joints and gaps but the creature, flexed and cutting metal edges, simply sheared off the invading vines. The colossal metal knight that reeked of twisted mana raised a battle axe to one arm and stumbled back as Hero's new little black hole pig companion began to suck at the knight as hard as it could with a tear in space. Delta couldn't even be worried about it right now. Hero needed any help that he could get. Nu could just deal with the other consequences later. The knight lashed out with a metal foot that was hollow on the inside. The pig squealed and had to run for cover, releasing the pull on the axe as the foot, while also being pulled, had enough force to swipe through the edge of the black hole. It was enough for Hero to get loose and begin to form mushroom spitters to try and dissolve the metal shield it had on its arm. The acid hissed, but the metal refused to warp as the black energy rushed in to protect it. Delta felt sick as the energy sounded as it was, um... Screaming, if her foe was a necromancer of some kind, and given the fact that the hero had literally bashed a skeleton, threw a ghost into a zombie not long ago, Delta was inclined to believe that she was correct. Then that energy would be some tortured force of souls and dark magic animating the night. A metal foe with no flesh and enchanted with energy hero wouldn't be able to just to consume. The princess was adapting and it made Delta nervous. Hero formed a mix of gut rot and burning mushrooms, throwing the volatile mix at the knight in hopes of just blowing the evil scrap. The knight just raised its shield but pulsed with a sickening crack. The projectiles were coated in a thicky, sloppy ectoplasm, causing them to fall to the floor inert. The knight stepped on it and the mushroom squelched as he swung his axe at the hero's head. Delta's monster grimaced, his entire arm began to grow more muscle and fiber, then he lashed out with a punch that would make Lord Mushy proud. Enchanted first collided with brutal axe and there was a pause as equal forces clashed, before the axe split into the hero's hand in twain. However, the two halves rapidly grew up to the weapon and pulled it at it. The weapon left the knight's grip and briefest of moments and the energy surrounding it vanished. The hero crushed the axe before, using vines to pull the blades across his own arm. Delta was on the edge of a metaphorical seat as the hero flexed his new weapon. Come on, do a cool heroic quote, she cheered, and the hero's smile twitched slightly brighter. He pointed his new axe hand at the helmet of the knight. I'm gonna break your face, he challenged. Delta really had to stop her creations getting bad movie quotes from her head. And don't call me Shirley, Wyam said bored. The fungal mancer shared a look with the tinker who was hiding behind the rock halfway across the room. Bloody coward, fungal mancer tried to explain how perhaps the death of the boy would not be good for anyone and perhaps letting the other pygmies gain the habit of sacrificing humans would be a bad thing. His spores reached up and Wyam reasonably read his intent. For the ultimate fiend and demon on the floor, she was actually quite pretty. 
However, Fungal Manson knew the prettiest things in the nature could be so because they were too dangerous to tangle with and had no need to hide. And how am I supposed to do anything? I'm quite rooted on the spot if your kin are, uh, well, they're in a dirty hole and I'm a lady of culture. You don't expect me to go down to some hillbilly hole? No, she said aghast. Well, if she could perhaps pass a message on to the Great Mother. Delta? Why, I am asked bluntly. Fungal Mansa waved his staff in panic and the audacity of the birch-like treat before it. One did not simply say the name of life and joy. Oh, you mean Delta, Delta, Delta? Delta with a big D, Delta with a Delta, and Delta-ish thing over the Delta. That Delta. Why, I went on a heresy, almost made Fungal Mansa charge in with a war cry. She smirked, her wooden face was features moving like liquid wood. So easy to rile up. Ah, you must visit more. Fine, fine. Let me see if mother is free, she said as she closed her eyes. The fungal mancer held its hands up in prayer. Please hold, Wyam said calmly as she began to make a strange, harsh, screeching noises. Fungal mancer did as he was told and kept his arms in the air, holding. Whatever the howl that Wyam was needed was calling. Delta, not there, not there. Hey, maestro, no, I can't talk. Got two pygmies on hold, but I can talk. Wyam said as she eased a manner, flexing her long branches as she was baffling her nails too, to the dark singer of Mother. Fungal Mansa's little beady eyes were about to pop out of its knife stalk. Wyam went still as the rock bounced off her face. The tinker looked at its hand in horror, as if unable to believe what it had just done. Maestro, um, I'm gonna have to call you back, she said emotionlessly. The silence stretched on for a moment. That was a rock. You just threw it in my face. Wyam said, then took a huge tree and deep breath. So, um, what can I do for you again? Wyam's smile seemed to crack loudly. The child, the fungal mansa puffed at her numbly, decided he might as well die doing his loyal duty. Dio accepted some more herbal soup from the gracious tone. He was a bit full, but his manners meant to him would refuse until he was utterly full. He could hear his team coordinating ropes and ladders to climb down, and he couldn't wait to show them all the cool face paint and flower crowns the little friendly mushrooms had put given him. One especially liked feeling his pulse, a little priestess one of the Dio could sort of communicate with. They lived in the heart of the underground, right? Then that was just the cutest thing Dio had ever heard of. As the ground began to shake, the entire tunnel seemed to rock back and forwards as a deep, primal scream in the earth seemed to come closer. From one of the tunnels, two pygmies ran inwards. Dio frowned as the puffs came rapidly. An old, smutty driftwood. One yelled back in the darkness. Wouldn't even use for kindling fire burns cold. The second with goggles taunted. The tunnels exploded with writhing roots and branches. Get back here so I can squeeze you until your little head's popped. The feminine voice traveled through the ground clear enough that even Dio could read it from the shaking alone. The root paused and as it poked at Dio. Ugh, I stepped in human. The voice went from murderous to disgust so fast that Dio was impressed. Hello, I'm Dio. He introduced himself and the root tried to snake away, ignoring Dio. You're a tree. Brand said he knew a lady tree down here. Do you know her? Dio asked as he crawled after the roots, avoiding the running pygmies with little homes. There was a pause and the root curled around Dio with a caressed movement. Oh, did he? The voice traveled into Dio's body, shaking his bones slightly. The voice sounded much happier now. Let's see. You're the child in trouble. Very well, I've saved you and thus you owe me a debt. The roots rumbled. Dio blinked. He'd been in trouble. No one had told him. I was fine, really. He tried to explain, but the voice turned flat. Oh, me, a uh, debt, she insisted, as she began to gently pull Dio through the tunnels that she had expanded with her roots. Come into my lair, little human. We have much to discuss, mostly about me and what that gorgeous Sir Fran may have mentioned about me. He did mention me in a good way, yes? The woman insisted. He saw the tunnel exit in the village being collapsed just in time for Grimm to show up his hands. Stop getting kidnapped! He yelled before the earth fell in. Delta frowned as she felt a low ping from Wyan. A quick glance mentioned something about the pygmies and some type of request. Wyan didn't seem too concerned, so Delta put it to the side for now as Hero cut one of the knight's arms off with a mighty rend of his power. The back hole pickle cap, adding a force to the blow and focused pulls of the portal. 
The night fell apart, the energies holding it together freed as they rushed through the ceiling and out into the world. Delta tried to applaud, but she felt uh, clammy and slightly tired all of a sudden. Warning, mana levels are critically low, regeneration is unable to match the growing costs. Hero, she groaned and the raid boss looked up in concern and he saw the flickering and thinning lines of mana to himself. Out of time, he said calmly and picked up his pig and began to walk back with his axe hand. They began to break apart and reappear as a secret garden before they even got ten feet away. The secret garden was such a cheat. Since it didn't exist in the dungeon or the actual world, Hero could reside there until Delta could recover without cost. He was less than a saw but more than nothing while there. Delta saw the fading double doors and would lead to the throne room. Soon, you brat, Delta grumbled before the signal vanished entirely without the hero to act as a proxy. It's free real estate, she announced with a grin. Sure, the rooms and space closest to the throne room were already getting boneheads and rat poison stir mobility, but Delta was just as equally making banking claims. Then Delta finally took a look at a dungeon. She stared, rubbed her eyes, and didn't actually exist in the space and looked again. I was gone for an hour. Tops, she moaned and flew off. End of chapter. Chapter 122. Trees a Company. And that's why you don't remove people's hearts in an attempt to honor me or them in the image of a hero, Delta said briskly, foot tapping on the ground below her. She stood there, having to the entire cavern of pygmies staring up at her in awe. Delta pointed to the shaped manner that she had floated over them all. One showed a heart floating over a dead stick man with X's at the eyes and a massive cross over it. Heart outside for visitors, bad, she said firmly. She moved on to the second image of the heart inside a person and then smiling, and a little happy figure of herself giving them a thumbs up. Hearts inside, good, she stressed. The pygmies all started to do the strange wave left to right, little arms and spears in the air. The chant started not long after, their small language and puffs coming in excited exclamations. Heart in, good. Heart out, bad. It was a little cultish, but the message seemed to be taken well. Delta really couldn't ask for more than a little devils that she found too adorable for their own good. New folded himself in since he was quite clearly done being Delta's blue board for the demonstration of why sacrificing guests was not productive to the dungeon experience. If they weren't such little stab-happy creatures, I'd advocate for clearing them out. New glowered at the pygmies, starting to bow at him, while two fiber threads were already planning the creation of the fungi thread mural that Delta squished the blue demon of New into the learning oracle. These fellows were, um, intense, if nothing else. From overzealous to undermining, let's go yell at YM. Kidnapping adventurers is bad enough. Ignoring the potential sacrifice of one is quite another thing entirely. Delta sighed and decided to check on the rest of the party before she left. They had entered the maze beyond the pygmy village. The twisting, narrow passages had tiny holes for the pygmies to fire blunt darts or make noises from little across the mural surface. Only a few starlight mushrooms dotted the place to show the way and help illuminate the mural, which showed Grun screaming when a pygmy touched his neck as he turned the corner. Kemi hyperventilating as the wall slid in closer and in her mind. It actually wasn't in her mind. The pygmies were very slowly had the hall narrow at one end over time, using devices Delta had installed out of sight. Amonster twitched on a very noise and poppy. She actually wasn't bothered, but still... Delta hadn't expected to make a spooky maze, but there it was all the same. It was just missing some proper shifting walls, mist, and spooky noises. They'd be there for a few moments more, and then they'd all have the keys necessary to reach Wyan. Delta really needed to sort out the tree before the innocent children fell into her grasp. She took off, giving the second floor once over as she flew past. Monsters looked settled, Bob was upstream sunbathing, Gramps was meditating in the frog spawn room as always, Rennie was, um, teaching his spooky skeleton crew how to perform a circus axe. Critters ran wild, chasing each other, mimicking the prey and predator act until one gave up and the other one was caught, then they both would nod and clock out, like the wolf and the sheepdog clocking out of work in the end of the cartoon. The first floor was a misery and a fantasy. The second floor was a paradise. In Delta's biased opinion, the pure, unfiltered best parts of nature, 
Nothing would eat you if you respected the rules. No insects would bite you. The fake sky was just warm enough to be soothing. Sure, the pygmies might rip out your heart, or Davina might be spooky, and Rennie didn't help, and Wyan was Wyan. There might be a few black spots on Dalta's lovely banana of fun, but nothing was perfect. Dalta, especially, wasn't perfect. The very gods of this world had been blunt about telling her how badly she messed up. They still liked her, though. She stepped into the bathroom when seeing Viam sitting on a mess of roots in the shape of a table and Dio cheerfully devouring honey. Different plants and slabs of meat cooked by Jeb and the floor below. Vera and Wyan didn't get quite on. Oh, you little dewdrop, tell me how lovely my eyes are again. Wyan almost sang. Dio nodded enthusiastically as he swallowed the chewy meat that was barely not burned. Jeb was improving. They're like the amber and the sweet honey. You have the best eyes in the trees that I've ever seen, he beamed, red hair flopping across his brow as he nodded. Wyam made a chittering sound like a small bird singing in delight. Dalta was pretty sure Dio had never seen another tree with any body parts, let alone eyes, but she didn't bring that up. Wyam paused as she saw Dalta standing there. Dalta mentally gave herself a check over, trying to not gasp with the unbeknownst to herself. Her avatar had gained more definition. Was this because of the hero and the efforts that he made on the third floor? Her business shirt remained crisp and wrinkle-free. Her simple tie reached down to her stomach and looked the same. But the long skirt that brushed her shins remained fashionable, at least. Shoes were a new addition, and on the other hand, sensible short heels and barely visible ankle socks. A watch in the same orange hue had appeared on how that she noticed. She heft was comfortable. The face was simply a read all around the circumference, delta time. Was she some uh, receptionist? No, the idea felt wrong. Delta didn't feel that she was in the position of the admirable workers who balanced income requests and their boss's orders and still managed to look amazing at the end of the day. Delta was... Uh, she was... Um, Listen here, she said, voice serious, demanding Viam's attention. The tree woman stiffened. Oh, Delta, I didn't see you there. Viam managed not to be simpering. Dio snapped his head up, looking around in excitement trying to spot Delta. Oh, I know you didn't see me. You also seem to have forgotten about me and my clear instructions and requirements for this dungeon run as a happy place where we all don't die. Dalta stressed the last bit, taking up the metaphorical gloves off for the first time since the pygmies needed the dressing down and bothering Jeb. Wyam brushed her head, face, and branch, not quite meeting her eyes. The boy's fine, she gestured to Dio, who waved frantically. After you were forced to intervene after others had come to you for aid, which you ignored after you had a temper tantrum. That's a lot of afters, Wyam. Floor blasts on the second floor. My agent on this floor, Dalta said, voice like steel. Wyam dropped the innocent expression. I didn't know my task was to protect every idiot that wandered into the floor. It also is a bit harsh to blame me for what the little pests decided to do of their own accord. She said, perhaps sulking a tad. They're learning. You know better. Delta cut the argument off before it could take root. It wasn't a guess. Wyam was simply formed with a far more logical mind and greater intelligence than most of the pygmies combined didn't possess. The woman was quiet for a few seconds. Then perhaps I should not be a boss you need, she said with a turned face, detaching herself from the conversation. The words should have made Delta soften her words and perhaps decide something was up. But something inside her, an urge of old swift thoughts rose up. Stop running. You hide behind cruel words and barbs, indifferent and snide comments, but you need to stop running from anything you see that could actually hurt you. You will not be released from your duty, because we both know it's something you enjoy. A measure of pride. Viam, spirit of old and new, grown from outside the dungeon. You feel like an outsider. Dalta's voice took on a strange hitch, and Viam snapped her head to her. Those amber and honey eyes were wide and angry. No, I just don't fit in this world because every damn plant and rock loves you like the sun shines out your back end and your words can make miracles. I don't have that love. I don't have that devotion. But you know what? I wish I did when it would all be so much easier to be here and maybe you love me back. Why I'm snapped and silence filled the room. Delta closed her mouth which was firm set to her jaw. 
If I didn't love you, then you would have been demoted or shipped off by now, Wyam. Delta took a calming breath and walked forward as Dio looked between Wyam and where she was looking with a deep frown. I do love you, but I also know that how fiercely you value your sense of self. Delta began, which had always felt true to Delta. I don't treat you like the others, that's true, because I don't want to erase the part that came with your creation. A part that is in my dungeon, but it is just as essential to who you are as Fran and Bacon or Rennie and his circus. This is a learning thing from both of us, and I'm sorry if you feel like I'm isolating you when in truth... I'm just giving you space to figure things out, Delta admitted. All I figured out was that life hurts and everyone discards you in the end. Wyam said quietly and Dio looked horrified as he read her smooth, wooden-like lips. That's wrong. Family and friends are until the end. I'm broken inside, but my parents didn't give me away. Dio exclaimed fiercely. Wyam let the boy jump down from her roots without a fight. Then you are fortunate enough to have a better life than I did. Be this one or the last. I messed up with the last one, and I keep pushing the envelope on this one. There is a sickness in my mind, little dewdrop. A little voice that keeps telling me to push and push until everyone is gone. That voice is me, Wyam said, sounding serene in her sorrow. There was no actual curse or sickness that Delta could detect in Wyam, but she understood what her boss was saying. Some people created a void of loneliness in their life and having nothing to fill it but self-loathing and hate. Delta's hand brushed Wyam's trunk softly. Maybe you're pushing against the wrong thing, but I think that's talk that we can have later. Just between the two of us, and then we can have it often, Delta promised, and Wyam didn't look at her. Sounds like a lovely time. I'll save my enthusiasm for it, perhaps. The tree said softly. Delta would take that. You couldn't handle a fix of trauma and issues with one talk or a single song. Although Delta was an idiot sometimes, she wasn't foolish. Grim looked up and down the large gates underneath the giant tree, the roots winding down and forming a gate and frame. Beyond the first gate were two more, and Grim hoped the one key would had would burn fakes. He really didn't want to go back to the little mushroom people cave, or the bridge that was unstable, or the bees. Never the bees. They never stopped talking. In one way, Grim had also glad that Dio had been kidnapped. Not only did they make Grim his dashing knight if he rescued the idiot, but they also passed a strange hot spring that they'd stayed clear of. But if Dio had been there... Ready? He asked the others. He shivered slightly as in many of those little mushroom people clung to the Kemi as she was like some idol they refused to part with. She smiled nervously, holding the key of the pygmies. Vass held up a key of the giant carberry. Grim held up the bee's key. All keys were the same shape and size, just one faintly smelled of honey. Grim inserted the key in the gate and went from wood to metal to golden metal, honey, and it drained away into two holes that one had seen before. The key in Grim's hand likewise melted. Really? He demanded as his hand was now dripping with more honey. Well, you do like to loot things, so sticky fingers isn't too strange, Amonster commented with a wicked grin. Grim made a note to let Amonster get smacked around a few more times in the coming fight before helping out. Cammy went next and her gate was pulled apart by bar by bar by tons of pygmy people in the walls, using the mechanism to reel the bars in. The group of three walked forward and pointed the key at Cammy's hand. She squeezed it as the key wriggled and unfolded itself and to show it was just another pygmy using some magical skill to pretend to be a key. Sure don't want these keys being reusable, nya. Poppy commented dryly. Grim was beginning to see that the pygmy key was also able to know if there was earned fairly because it itself was a pygmy. A spy. Bass went forward and inserted the next key. He paused and Grim saw that he had really give the key a proper twist for a click. There had been a long creaking noise as the gate before them shattered into dozens of pieces. The lock suspended in the air by Vass's grip on the key alone. The key shattered next. It is so very dramatic and lovely, Kemi said as after a moment, every the optimist. Holy heroic pots, move in. We have an idiot to rescue, Grim commanded. His eye twitched as the group casually walked in the disorganized manner ahead towards the open tunnel. He sighed and stumped after them. No one heard or saw the gates sliding back into place behind them and reforming. These gates demanded the three keys untouched for entry. Delta's secret trick had finally been revealed in rapid succession. 
Three keys were used up, and the next group were forced to get three untouched keys. And once all six had been used up, three random keys would spawn in. The treasure hunt and the jungle remix. After all, what was the point of making six challenges if the groups kept taking the same three every time? That was boring. End of chapter. Chapter 123 Grim swallowed once he stepped out of the tunnel of roots behind the rest of his team. He turned his head, noting that the roots snaked closed, blocking the way back. That was expected, but Serena's normally only had two ways out. Victory or death. Well, those used to be the only options. This dungeon is abnormal, just like Durance, he thought. Slightly annoyed at his very first dungeon run was in this weird place. Annoyed, but also a little relieved that he wasn't going to die at the first mistake he made. Grim had made uh, a lot of mistakes. But there he was, staring into a large chamber filled to the brim with mist. Dio! Amonster called out, his voice carrying into the space. Well, that the big nasty didn't know where we were here, he does now, Poppy said dryly, as she pulled her hood down tighter as her eyes searched the mist, sniffing like some animal. Kemi bit her lip as she waited for some response. He could be dead, but it doesn't match what we've seen so far, Bass supplied helpfully, his golem nature making him even the blunt speaker. Not dead, came the amused voice. It was like honey spread across the dagger, sweet and dangerous. He merely understands the rules and he knows the place. A woman's voice sounded out, somehow coming from behind there he is, from the mist itself, from the very room. Show yourself, Kemi shouted, taking the lead as the adult of the group. Her staff was gripped tightly, her cloudy dress no longer amusing, but billowing dramatically as she held her staff forward. Reveal your true form, she commanded, a light shining off of her, repelling the mist like a barrier as it erected. The woman's voice laughed, a deep, throaty chuckle, causing the mist to swirl over the grass, small, bubbling brooks and creeks. Sweet maiden, I'm not hiding, you're just not looking hard enough. The voice promised as Grim turned to check the exit and paused. Despite somehow not taking a single step, the exit was now to his right, not behind him. Was the room able to move, or uh, had his balance tilted him slightly? He Grim opened his mouth to warn the others, but they all saw the dark shape looming in the mist, moving like something exotic, tempting them to come dance with the confusing mist. Without any warning, the mist peered back and like a curtain on a stage. Before Grim and the others, a tree rose up in the center of the room. A tree thick of wood and roots from the ground up before the bark smoothed into slender legs and knees halfway up. Dozens of branches swayed as flowering vines grew over where anything indecent would be visible. Still, Grim flushed at the slightly curvy and round stomach, then looking up at those thick lips. Her hair was spread between fibers and branches, every single one of them covered in some flower of sorts. It was mesmerizing as no flower shared shape or color with another, like the tree woman collected every beautiful flower in the world for herself. She turned her eyes to them as if just noticing something interesting, and despite the vision of summer and spring before them, when Grim looked into her honey amber eyes, he felt the sting of winter staring back. My, my, such a, uh, interesting collection of people. While I may not be that impressed, you collected the keys, you reached my gate, and here you stand, she said and turned her body sensually to them as she did so, in her hidden hand, tightly woven branches into a rough hand shape, a cage made of roots and flowers came into sight, dangling from one finger. Inside, the sleeping form of Dio was visible, like the colorful bird inside a birdcage. Dio! Cammy cried, reaching out, but Poppy kept her from running in. He's not dead for a reason, she said darkly. Her eyes slitted like some cat's creature. The tree woman noticed the expression and smirked. Oh, quite. One, Delta doesn't kill, therefore I do not. Be grateful for that. Two, I'm experimenting with themes and ideas for my fight. Lovely Sir Fran is forward and simple. Fight with your heart and be brave. 
Myself, I believe I might be a trial of the heart as well. She mused and held the cage up. I recently found the issue of one's heart and the feelings it invokes troubling. Perhaps I'll learn more if I see your little heart splutter and need to protect this one. She hummed, drawing her words out in a slight song to an extent. Grim looked at his team with a frown. They all looked upset, except for Vance, who looked like he had shot through some awakening, had three breakdowns and was now looking upon his goddess. That he was also wanted to set on fire. If only I could be so grossly magnificent, he said with longing. None are as beautiful as I, child, of earth and soul. I am a wyan, and once great tree of legend, back with a blackened soul. Fight me, reveal to me your heart's light, she commented, holding Dio's cage aloft as root snaked vines obscured their teammates from his view. Poppy didn't hesitate, throwing herself forward with mobility a human just did not have. Her fingers wreathed in dark flames. Wyam smacked Poppy with a whip of a vine, her trunk barely scorching. Grim winced as she landed in a roll into the mist. I've embraced hell. You'll have to go much hotter, little lovebird. Wyam encouraged with little care to her voice. The truth cuts deep, Gabby chanted, holding her staff aloft as blades of glowing white sheared through the air at Wyan as horns and some instrument that sounded electrical in nature blazed into the dramatic battle cry of them. Vass, Amonster, back up, Grim yelled as he went in from the side, his sharp knife in one hand. As Wyam turned and danced around the light crescents that Kemi conjured, some of her flowers and bark were chipped away. Grim used the distraction to leap off a slightly jutting rock in the ground towards the birdcage, swiping where it had connected to the rest. His hope for a quick and easy cut was dashed when his knife got stuck in one of the fingers. He felt his foot being snagged and he was flung high into the air with a yell as the tree woman was multitasking with attacking and defending from all sides. Amonster was using long coils of hair like writhing snakes, empowered by necromantic energies, to try and tie down as many of Wyam's branches as he could. But there were far too many. Vass had two vines in each hand, pulling and slightly bowing Wyam's towards him, her face a grimace as they matched in pure strength. Grim turned, managing to angle himself towards Wyam instead of the pond that she threw him towards, crashing into her mass. She snapped a few branches and found himself above to where her shoulder was. I hate pests in my hair. Wyan warmed around him. Her hair tried to wrap around him. Grim managed to reach into his belt and pull out a ragged cat doll from the pouch. He hadn't found much use for this weird reward and had gotten from chasing that mouse on the first floor. Come on, ghost cat, he chanted out from the doll, and a blue cat snarled into Wyam's face, yowling and hissy as Wyam let loose a screech of indignation. By now, Poppy and Kemi were winding up another barrage of attacks, and Amister was chanting. Grim pulled himself through the branches to his trapped knife. He began sawing with a grim determination. Al hovered over the outside of the bore of the cave. He felt a pull with every fiber of his being as if something was inside that was. Al took a step back, panic rising and the fear sinking in his hymn on the system pinged again and again. Al had stopped even reading the subject lines on them now. If he just worked harder, the system would stop. If he was the strongest, he'd be fine. He clutched at his head as his quest log was almost empty. He needed quests. If he didn't find any soon, he'd have nothing to do with what the system pulled the plug after that. What if that was the last straw? You going in? came a relaxed voice. Al turned with a gasp, his squire uniform from the kingdom rustling slightly. Some kid was roasting meat over a fire. His youngish face seemed at odds with the easygoing nature. Alpha felt like he knew this boy, but after so many quests and so many jobs, he wasn't sure. I don't think that I should, Al said quietly. I think you should. I'd go in, but I won't be here long. I'm a wanderer. The boy grinned at something amusing, and Alpha didn't get the joke. Al's powers didn't register the kid as anything, so he was either too low a level or unimportant or not relevant to the system. Alpha 
Hadn't seen that happen too many times, but decided the boy was a nice distraction from the choice of whether to go inside or not. I am Al, he said quietly. The boy paused as if not expecting the need to introduce himself. Blether, Blether's the name, he said, and his name appeared above his head like a whenever someone revealed their name to Alpha. His detect lie was pretty high as a skill, so he didn't think the boy was lying, or he was maybe a god of trickery. Again, it didn't matter. So why the hesitation? You look sick and like you're expecting to die at any minute, Blether said, changing the subject casually. Alpha sat gingerly on the nicely shaped stump and the other side of the fire. I feel cold to go in, and that's dangerous, Al explained. Why? the kid pressed, chewing some weird fish that was hard to look at, and the system labeled it as a uh, fish? Question mark. Definitely some being able to bypass Al's senses than detection skills. This might be a good chance to get an epic quest. No, it didn't matter. Only quests. You didn't set off any of my, um, powers. It's something I can't explain, and embracing it could be a mistake. He told the kid logically. So unknown, unknown, and unknown. Hecking heck, you're really messed up. How do you ever leave the house? Brother asked to the shake of the head. Alpha looked at the fire for a moment. Fear, he summed up. There was a pause in the conversation for a second. So, if it doesn't appear to help you with your powers, it's a trap, pointless, or wasting valuable time. Fear of dying is worse than the joy of living. I see, Brother frowned, throwing the cooked stick away, somehow even managing to eat the fish bones. Ever think of why you were chosen for this? Brother asked abruptly as he pulled a knife out into the piece of wood, whittling it away with a skill beyond any child. Random selection, cruelty, simple logic, Alva shrugged, still feeding the pull of the cape, a warm thing that made him want to give in so badly. Doubt it. Have you seen this world? It's messy and already way too cruel in some places. I don't see the point in throwing you into all that just to add to the existing problems. No, I think it was something else. You don't get powers and purpose by chance, Brother promised. Alpha supposed he could have given other people some blessings or power himself as, uh, whatever he truly was. Let's say I can see things and I saw you when you first came here, like memory foam on a really good bedspread. Love that stuff. Blether smiled whimsically and Alpha frowned, wondering if the strange place called Durance had memory foam, or even foam for that matter, already. How strange was this place? You were curious and bright. I saw the first few days. Awkward as hell, I think. I just don't think. Listen, Al, uh, it wasn't your fault, the kid said, and Alpha stood up so abruptly that he nearly stepped in the fire. Don't, he warned, voice crackling. You did everything you could. The silence, brother began, but Alpha painfully squeezed his eyes shut and tried to cover his ears like he was a small child again. The boy's voice seemed to echo out in his bones. The silence took that village to preemptively stop you. In a way, they succeeded. Blethers said bluntly, and Alpha reached out his weapon, drawing it as angry tears welled up. His best weapon felt too heavy in his hands. Good. Making a choice without a promise of reward and for the sake of it. I swear, I didn't want to step in, but enough is enough. I'm not trapped like she is, but this has spent my strength on top of Dalton needing help from the old bastard tree. The creek grunted and stood up, more like an old man. Alpha, get your head out of the damn sand. Also, answer your damn letters. There's like a bunch of rare mounts and costumes that sis tried to apologize with. The kid said as he faded away, crumbling into the earth as if time was devouring him. It also left Al with a burning campfire and a strange feeling that he had been talking to death, and yet, and yet it felt good. His tears fell and the sword clattered to the ground. He hesitated, and then, without being able to take it back, opened the most recent letter. Dear Alphonse, I wonder if you'd like that name, or you said you didn't like your actual name, so how about that one? You're really close to Delta, and she's really nice. Please say hi. I've been busy updating some systems around the dungeon sphere, but it's a little hard. Delta's code seems to work on wishes and mushroom powder. I got a few quests that I can offer for cleaning up Delta's dungeon and helping her on the lower floors. It isn't much EXP as you might like, but I'll keep making more, and also the people of Durance should offer some. 
Please feel better. It's very hard to see you so upset. You used to smile, and I'm very sorry that I might have had a hand in taking it away. If you wish to hate me, I'll accept this. As all my letters, I never blamed you, nor do I think that you are a failure or imperfect. I cannot be perfect. Please be kind to yourself. Signed, System. Please call me Sis. Letter since your last open letter, 301. Al tried to put his hand on the screen, but there was no resistance. Letter 300. Oh, on your way to Durance, I'm so happy. You'll finally get some nice friends, and there's someone very important to meet there. L- letter 246. You seem to have stopped looking to die, but you aren't alive. I feel so hopeless. 180. Please stop this, please. Quests won't make you feel better. Head to Durance, head anywhere. 100. Happy 100 letter. I put a nice little ritual circle in the letter to conjure a cake. I, uh, hope it tastes okay. I got the tips from Delta's kitchen. Please eat. Please. On and on they went. He skipped dozens in numb manner, flicking through them to the point that there was less emotion and more simplistic messages. He reached the last letter that he had ever opened. The tone between the newest letters and this one was stark. Letter 10. Alpha. The village of Mayuri is gone. No trace can be found. It would appear that the cult called the silence attacked there to get to you. This was beyond your control. You need more strength. This will not stop. The silence will always be your concern. You need more power. Keep moving and you will be instructed on where to proceed. Soon Beta will come and your fear will end. Then Gamma and your doubt will cease. Then Delta and your weakness will be removed. System. It hurt and it burned down. Alpha saw every word as a warning, every name as a nail in his coffin. Without his fear, what was Alpha? He feared the day heroes with those names rose up to make him obsolete. And now, Delta was a dungeon. Beta was a monster that devoured monsters that revealed silence members. Gamma was... Well, according to the last letter he skimmed through, which was quite a while ago, according to its date, Gamma was being used in some underwater rebellion led by the Shark Prince as a... sword? Since then, Alpha had so many letters, and it was like the system changed. No longer some ambivalent deity judging him for his weakness, but someone with fears and doubts of their own, and it made him deflate and his fear took an uncertain step back. Again, because there was still no answer from when he first asked. Without his fear, what was Alpha? Slowly, he looked up at the large puzzle door that it had taken him a single attempt to open, lining up the symbols for Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta to make the door slide open. There was one way to find out what life without fear was, and it laid inside that door. My beautiful face! Wyam howled as she ignored the others attacking her and sent dozens of thorny snaking vines after Grim, who screamed in terror. It was just a cat, he yelled back as he jumped over the ground, exploding in the wrath as Wyam glared. Three claw marks on either cheek scratched downwards, giving her a whiskered appearance. It was more than a damn cat, doubters howling in laughter and telling me to believe it over and over. I will show you, catty, Wyam promised in rage. Grim just ran faster, hoping that Amonster and Poppy were nearly done popping the birdcage open with their combined powers. Grim was tiring and he did not want to know if Wyam would see what was inside his heart the good old-fashioned way. Dissection via being pulled apart. Not the cleanest way to go. He scowled at the feeding of vines on his heels. If anyone told him that trees needed to be protected ever again, he was going to strangle them. End of chapter. And that, my friends, is the end of this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the channel. There are numerous links down below. The easiest way would be to share this video and this channel to as many people as possible to help this channel grow. Your support is very much appreciated. And I will see you all in the next video. Cheers.